Well, good day and welcome to today's film screening and webinar featuring the short film, The Living of the Pigeons and its producer, producer Mr. Baha Abu Shanat. My name is Peter McCary and I serve you as executive for the Middle East and Europe in global ministries of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and United Church of Christ. Global Ministries is glad you have joined us as we engage Israel-Palestine intensively this week during our 2022 second quarter advocacy focus. I want to extend a special thanks to my colleagues in Global Ministries, Becca Choate and Krista johnson Weixel, for all of their hard work in preparing this advocacy focus. It is appropriate that we focus on Israel-Palestine this week as Palestinians commemorated Nakba Day yesterday, May 15th. Nakba is an Arabic word that means catastrophe and refers to the events following the declaration of the establishment of Israel and the subsequent displacement and dispossession of Palestinians, resulting in the destruction of more than 400 Palestinian towns and villages and more than 750,000 Palestinian refugees who fled to the West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria and other countries. Counting their descendants, there are now more than 5.7 million Palestinian refugees registered with the United Nations. And since the 1967 war, Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem continue to live under Israeli occupation and blockade. We are particularly saddened by the killing of Palestinian American journalist Shireen Abu Akla late last week as she was covering an Israeli raid into the Janine refugee camp. It is our hope that the special events Global Ministries offers in the next few days will encourage you to learn, pray, and engage the reality through the perspectives of deep disciples and UCC partners and mission co-workers, not just this week, but in a sustained way to seek justice and peace in Israel-Palestine and the Middle East. Today, we have the unique opportunity to watch together The Living of the Pigeons, an award-winning 16-minute documentary that portrays the harsh experience of Palestinian workers crossing an Israeli checkpoint between Bethlehem and Jerusalem, part of the infrastructure of occupation and the restrictions that Palestinians face on a daily basis. The documentary has been screened in more than 32 film festivals worldwide, including in France, Italy, Germany, the United Arab Emirates, the United States, and Palestine. And it is a special privilege for us today to have with us Mr. Baha Abu Shenab, the film's producer, who will share a few words of background before we watch the film, and then afterwards discuss further the film and the circumstances it portrays. And he'll take your questions. Baha is a film production graduate of Dar al Kalima University in Bethlehem, Palestine. Dar al Kalima University is a partner of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ and United Church of Christ through Global Ministries and is one of the member institutions of the DR Consortium, of which the Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahib, Palestinian Lutheran pastor and, pre and preeminent contextual theologian, is president. Before graduating in film production, Bahat received his diploma degree in documentary film production, also from Dar al Kalima University, in 2015. During his six years of studies, he has produced several film projects, including The Living of the Pigeons. Baha is currently completing his master's degree in documentary film at Goldsmiths University of London. We are delighted to welcome Baha in our midst. He joins us from Bethlehem today. Baha, welcome, ahlan wa sahlan. And we'd like to ask you if you'd offer a bit of background before we screen your film. Hello, um, good evening everyone. Thank you, Peter. Um, thank you for this introduction and thank you for this opportunity uh, to screen the film and to talk uh, about my experience with this film and about uh, my Palestinian experience of filming uh, this short documentary um, on the checkpoint, 300 checkpoint, which is located in the north of Bethlehem, uh, separates Bethlehem between Jerusalem. Um, I'll give a little background on how I got the idea at this film, um, and then I'll let uh, people watch it, and then we can uh, talk about it afterwards. Um, uh, I had the chance to get an Israeli permit to enter uh, Jerusalem 
to actually apply for a U.S. visa. Um, I had my sister was living there, she was living in Washington D.C. Um, and she sent me uh, an invitation letter, so I had to apply for a permit, and the permit was for 12 hours. Um, my brother was uh, in town that time, so we decided, and he had a permit, so we decided to go and enjoy some time in Jerusalem, and then maybe towards the sea. That's actually what we did. I had my interview, and then we went to the sea. We enjoyed our day. Uh, you don't get the chance to see the sea much, so it's an opportunity. Uh, and then going back, um, I went back from 300 checkpoint. Uh, we we were walking back, and I saw a picture in my mind that uh, struck me and and stayed in 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 my mind for a while. It stayed almost a year until I came back to the same checkpoint, and I said, "Okay, I wanna I wanna capture what I saw in that moment, and I wanna share it with people." Uh, especially Palestinians, and then I hope uh, the world will see also what these uh, Palestinian workers go through because of this checkpoint. So that's uh, the, the story and how I, the idea that I got the film. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and yes, talk soon, talk after the film. Great, thank you. Um, we look forward to, uh, to watching it together. And as Becca has put in the chat, uh, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box and we will, uh, we will engage those after the screen. شعب غلبان بيجوا على الساعة واحدة في الليل والساعة ثلاثين في الليل حتى يجيبوا لقمة رزقة ولادهم هير فيه وقلت لك تأخذ الدرجة الأولى معناة الشعب
Ik weet ik wel. Dan zie ik je maar van een hot pan zijn zijn hier. Dan een robot maar zijn we kijken we. We gaan hier zo even koop. بس ما نقدرش انا نقيمو بربا لانو خدمناه بربا في كاميرات عم بيجي بيحكيلك شو ليش عملت هيك يمكن تعرض للمساعدة القانونية إذا كنت عم تخرج انا بعم نشوف المحل الأفضل لانو مين بيروح الجهة هذيك نرميو ولا هيك بحيث انو ما نعطلش على العمال كمان نص ساعة نبلشو في عمال شي كمان من الأرض زي ما انت شايف نبلشو العمال ينطوا تستغني ولا تصير ملت مليار دير إذا تلاكي حق كلهم حق ربط الخبز ربطين خبز تروح إلا ولادك ما حد يشي يطلبك في حاجة وجاجة وسنة أنت بتعيش أو أنت بتكون, بتكون في نعيم أول آه بس الحين الحين ولت ولت هاربة الدنيا الحين نروح مشوار غير على العكازة جايك ان الله ما الصابرين
الخمس سنين اللي لعب مع بعض والخمس سنين بالشكل هذا هيك زي ما انت شايف ما تغيرش عليه شيء يعني ولا جد عليه جديد الا بالعكس كل يوم بيزيد سوء عن عن اليوم الثاني كل يوم بيزيد سوء عن عن اليوم الثاني بيجي بيطلعوا عليه كاتبين هان ارما على ان هذا الممر للحالات الانسانيه وكبار السن والمرضى وكل حكى هذا كذا ما بده علميه ويخليهم يحشوا بين الشغيله يخليهم بين الحشوه بين الشغيله الا المريض بزيد مرضه والختيار في السن بتكسر بزياده والنسوان بتفصلهم كل حكى هذا يعني لا لا حالات انسانيه ولا بيعرف حالات انسانيه تقدر تعيش شهر انت طب هذا نص العالم استورها تضايقت كل انخلق كل تضايق كل اخذوه على المستشفى والنص روح والنص روح والنص روح هذا عيش الدنيا والله عيش الدنيا هذه حياتنا يعني على المعبر عندنا خمس ست سنين ست سنين على المعبر هذيك بس صباح على حجي بالحال هذيك بسكعة بمطر بصيف بشتاء هيك دعاني نفسي نفسه والله العظيم انا بقول الله يعين بصدق وامانه بقول الله يعين الناس والله مو فكرك يعني الواحد لما بطلع من الساعه 3 بروح الساعه 5 كيف بدي اشوف اولاده وكيف بدي اشوف شو مشاكل اولاده شو مشاكل عياله شو في عندهم مشكله شو بس عندهم مشكله كثير اني ساعه بدي اشوف طب بس بروح مو مسكين بنت الولا بحط راسه بنا والساعة ثلاث ما بسدك مسدك الله وتنين الساعة ثلاث مش هنكون يجري شو الحياة 
حياة مرة يا عم حياة مرة حياة مرة والله يا عم حياة مرة شو احساسنا؟ احساسنا زينا زي الناس قلت لك هي احنا الحين بنروح اي منك زي 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 الدواب والله العظيم بنحط وسط بننام العين بتروح بتحط راسك بتنام الساعة 3 العصرية بتكون بتاكل لك لكمة مش عارف شو وتتحمم الا الساعة 5 المغربية بتعود نفس الكرة بتنام كل عمل عمال شو الحياة؟ مو بس يعني الانسان انخلق بس مشان ياكل ويشرب بس يعني هيك انخلق نحن يعني طب ما لناش حق يعني ان يعني نشوف حالنا يوم يوم واحد بس نشوف حالنا ما فيش حياة مرة يا حياة مرة والله يا عم حياة مرة قلت لك كمان مرة بقول الله يعيننا أكثر من أكثر It's a powerful presentation about life at the checkpoint, checkpoint 300 that separates Bethlehem from Jerusalem. Um, I just want to, uh, to thank Baha again for his art in presenting this to us um, and remind our audience that if you have questions uh, to please put those in the Q&A box. Um, I know that Baha will be eager to respond to those. Baha, thank you for for that uh, depiction of life at the at the checkpoint, uh, the the man who is at the kiosk and narrates the film toward the end says it's a bitter life. Um, for those some of some of those in our audience will know checkpoint three hundred and perhaps have experienced it themselves. Others may not have. Could you maybe just start by sharing with us what checkpoint three hundred is and what the people who are lining up so early in the morning are there to do? Uh, yes, for sure, Peter. Um, actually, the, the checkpoint, the way it is now, is completely different, um, at least from the inside, than the way that I shot. At. Of course, I couldn't really um, shoot with my camera within the next stage, which is the um, searching stage and you go and you show your ID or your pass or your permit because um, I was only allowed to shoot behind the wall and it's actually there's next to this checkpoint is the separation wall uh, which separates Bethlehem from Jerusalem and, and that checkpoint actually is very near to Rachel's tomb uh, which is in the same area that the, 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 the ch this checkpoint is, is uh, designated um, actually, Peter, 
um, after the COVID situation, they really closed in a way that a checkpoint for, for cars, at least, uh, because there is a way for cars and the people who live in Jerusalem and, you know, they go between Jerusalem and Beit Lahim. Um, and the reason for that is because there is another one in Beit Jalla, which is the tunnel one, which is the bigger one, which is designated for um, uh, settlers. So this one is actually made, no one that is made for Palestinians. So there is no um, really care if it's closed or not, or there's people crossing or not. Um, but mainly it is uh, created for Palestinians and people from the West Bank who wants to go inside Jerusalem, um, the ones that who live in the South, which is um, mainly uh, from Beit Lahem, from Hebron, um, and those areas. Um, why people get, get up this early to go to the checkpoints is because of the rush hour. And again, if, if, it's, if it was designed for the, this amount of people to cross, which Israel actually needs, they need this labor work, they need the, this workforce from Palestinians, which is um, not paid very well, dirty jobs, uh, um, they need them. But in a way, there's these checkpoints that are designed um, in a way, the, the maximum people that can enter with no hustle is like a hundred person. But imagine if there's six thousand workers who need to cross every day because of their uh, permits, and they cannot actually sleep inside uh, their workplace. Though that some of them do, and they sleep in a very, very bad situations and bad environments, just because they don't want to keep doing this crossing, which is um, inhuman in a way and, and, and not logical. Imagine you, you, you go back from your work like the narrator of site was speaking, that you go back around six o'clock, you want to have dinner, spend some time with your kids, and then you need to get up around 2 a.m. again. So it's, uh, it's very hard. Um, but now there's a lot of improvements to it, for it, uh, improvements in a way that are not in, in, in the favor of Palestinians or Palestinian workers. Um, uh, they designed electronic gates. They put some music like the, you know, hotel music in order for, <laughs> for workers to enjoy some of the, I call it the hotel music, you know, when you get into the elevator and there's always this background music. Sometimes they, they, they make it. Uh, similarly, they're doing the same in Colombia checkpoint. Again, these checkpoints that there's no settlers that cross from. Uh, it's only designated for Palestinians who hold either permits or Jerusalemites who hold the blue ID. Yeah, uh, I hope I answered the question. So these are day laborers, Palestinians who are from the West Bank and uh, work on a daily wage uh, inside uh, on the other side of the wall uh, in Jerusalem, including East Jerusalem, which is also occupied uh, as well as other places. Uh, and they compete with each other uh, for those jobs um, on a daily basis. And so that's part of the reason they get up early, isn't it? Yes, yes, for sure. Because um, like you said, many of the wor these workers are also going to uh, set on the side of the road inside Jerusalem um, and wait for people to come and say, yeah, I have this thing in my house that needs to be fixed. And then you can like, I need three, two people. Um, these are the kind of three contract ones. Uh, um, and there's the ones that actually cannot get up this late. So they go around 5 a.m. and they go into this rush hour and they start jumping on each other because they want to get there. After 8 a.m., most of the jobs are taken. Uh, so you need to be there early to, to get your, your living. So what you've uh, presented really is the, the, what you call the rush hour of day laborers who are crossing. A question in our audience is that uh, I've only, I only saw one woman in the film. Do any women go through the checkpoint on a daily basis for work or for other reasons? Yes, yes, they do. Um, um, I don't know the numbers, 
but there's uh, a lot of women that cross and I saw during my film, but um, of course I had to be very respectful uh, in a way with my camera many times is that um, either you ask if you can uh, film this person um, and during like a said rush hour, nobody want to be stopped even to be asked about anything. Uh, it's, it's 3 a.m., it's 4 a.m. Nobody wants to talk to a camera. And to a young boy who was studying in a university trying to make something about this checkpoint. Um, many of the women work in, in hospitals. Um, uh, they work in farms and farming, and collecting fruits. Um, I do not have uh, a lot of information about uh, what's the situation of women across the of what, what the kind of jobs that they work inside. But I know from what I saw on the checkpoint is that men usually, um, they make a space for women to cross because it's also a very a smaller number than men. Uh, and for them, it's a cultural thing also not to be jammed between men. So they, they somehow, they start telling each other, oh, let this, uh, uh, this woman cross. So they make them the space and they let them cross. Uh, peacefully. Supposedly, there is a, a lane called humanitarian lane, which is Britain humanitarian lane, but as Abed mentioned in the film, that it's actually there just for the press um, or for foreigners who come and read that it's a humanitarian lane. If someone is on a wheelchair, most of the time it's closed. Like he told me 99% of the time it's closed, whether somebody's on a wheelchair or on a sticks, they do not open it. Um, either you go through and let them, let, let your fellow workers make you cross. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the film, by dawn, uh, you see an empty uh, corridor with, uh, with the coffee cups and other things uh, strewn along the pathway. Uh, of course, this is also the checkpoint where uh, families and other people going to Jerusalem uh, for other reasons uh, pass through during the day as well, isn't it? Yes, yes, for sure. It's, it is the, for example, if I get a permit now, I cannot, and I have a Jerusalemite friend uh, who has a car, a yellow plate car, an Israeli uh, registered car, I cannot cross through the car lane. Um, I am uh, obligated by the Israeli law to cross through uh, the 300 checkpoint lane uh, for Palestinians. Um, and so yeah, this, these are the situations with the permits. Uh, but my father, for example, had to go uh, to Augusta Victoria Hospital, which is in Jerusalem. And I was, um, there's this bus that the Palestinian Authority um, designated for people who are going to hospitals who have the permits. And I was the com companion beater, like I was the person who was uh, uh, with my father. So they gave me a permit for the, for the, uh, for the time that my dad needed uh, to do his uh, uh, therapy there. And uh, so I was able to cross in the bus. But every time there's another thing crossing the bus because you, if, if they see that it's a bus for Palestinians, they put it on the side and then they get everybody down. And sometimes we had can cancer patients who were unable to even get out of the bus, but they were forced to get out of the bus. And when I saw this, honestly, I, I for some while, Peter, I, I don't want to be now emotional and everything, but I, I lost, I lost like my my hope in humanity of. of of Israeli soldiers is like, it's honestly inhuman seeing cancer patients getting out of the bus to be served, men mainly. Sometimes they're, they're a little like softer with women, but it's, it's the same. It's uh, because they, there's no female soldiers to frisk them because by the law also there's going to be female soldiers to, to serve women. Um, but that's why they keep them in the bus sometimes. So yeah, the situation is, is complicated, whether you are on foot or in the car, if you have the Palestinian ID. You referred to Augusta Victoria Hospital, and for those who don't know, that's a hospital on the Mount of Olives uh, that is affiliated with the Lutheran World Federation and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, and is a specialized hospital for cancer treatment. 
Uh, there's a question uh, that says, I went through this checkpoint back in 2009, about midday, and missed the crush of the people. Are the elevated guard walkways in the processing section still there? Earlier, uh, Bahat, you mentioned that you weren't able to film inside, uh, but uh, could you maybe just describe in a little bit more detail uh, what things are like inside the, the so-called terminal? Yes. Um, so I, to be honest, I, I crossed maybe three to four times from this checkpoint uh, back in the days and newly uh, with my visits with my father, I, I had to cross once by foot. Um, but just to be sure, Peter, can you explain for me, please, um, what is the elevated guard walkways? The area above where most of the people are walking through, uh, ele an elevated area, so, um, you know, platforms where soldiers are walking around and monitoring the people um, from above. Ah, uh, yes, ah, uh, yes, of course. These are, there will never, they are, Yes, these are like the main um, infrastructure of this uh, of this checkpoint because these are the ones who give them the the ability to survey, like the, for the ability for the surveillance of the of the Palestinian workers while they're standing there. Um, in the second stage, it's a it's a stage where there's the metal detector thing and where you put your stuff, and then you and then the third stage is where you show your permit and your ID, and now Palestinians are, uh, there's a card designed, it's called uh, the magnetic card, which you get uh, from the, it's an Israeli office made for Palestinian residents in the West Bank, where you go there, you give your 10 fingerprints, um, they make a full security check on you, and then they give you this card, which will make you able to apply for a permit. So um, any Palestinian who, who doesn't have this card can't apply for a permit. So you need to have this card, which is, it's only a card that, that you went through, let's say the security check, and that you're not uh, a person with danger to the state of Israel, any person. Uh, whether you're young, old, whoever. Uh, the, the people who are um, under 16, they can go along with their parents. But other than that, you need this card. So the third stage has a card now where you can tap it in a way or like make it, uh, uh, swipe it. And then the gate either opens or it doesn't open. So now you cannot actually discuss with, with, uh, with soldiers or they're not soldiers anymore, by the way, on the security. This is like a side note that now it's private security companies that run the checkpoints because in a way the army got tired and started telling the government, you know what, like we're the army, why, why are we supposed to, you know, stand there and let these people get inside and get out? Like, so they started a uh, private security, like Israeli security companies started taking over the checkpoints and they, they are the ones who run it, of course, under the any uh, the Israeli army, but and and everybody in the security guards are um, soldiers who serve for the army and they give their time in the army, and well trained ones because these are the ones that you need to put in front of Arabs or Palestinians. Um, so yeah, these are these are the three stages, and the way out is much easier, of course, uh, because nobody checks you when you get back into Bethlehem. You've depicted in the, in the film obstacles upon obstacles and uh, obstacles within obstacles, and you've just described that even further uh, in your answer just now. Uh, one question comes from Susan Brogdon, who served as an ecumenical accompaniment, uh, ecumenical accompanier through the ecumenical accompaniment program in Palestine and Israel, which is a program of uh, the Jerusalem churches and the World Council of Churches, uh, which we will be featuring tomorrow. So our audience uh, should uh, tune in tomorrow for some more uh, engagement uh, 
and to hear from Susan, uh, who spent three months in Bethlehem uh, at the checkpoint. And she asks, uh, she understands that there have been improvements made, those electronic permit readers, the hotel music, as you called it, uh, but uh, wonders if there's any, if, has anything been done to make the checkpoint entrance in Bethlehem less ugly, less narrow, less dirty, and less difficult? The one on the outside? No. It's still the same narrow lanes that you have to get into. And now they divided them in two since the, end, the exit is different. So imagine the same lane that you saw, but now it's double. So there are two lanes, but it's one gate. So it's like, so it lets people stand into this. Is the, at least the last time I saw it, I, I haven't seen it since the last nine months because I was in London, which is, I'm happy that I didn't see it <laughs> since that long. Um, um, but yes, it's uh, the last time I saw it, there was, it became two lanes, same entrance, and the ones inside where it happened, the, imp the improvements where the soldiers stand, um, where there's probably air conditioning, maybe. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It doesn't make getting a permit any easier and it doesn't make the process uh, that people have to go through uh, waking up at one or two in the morning just to get in line uh, any easier. So these are in a way cosmetic improvements. Uh, there is in the chat uh, from Krista uh, some information about Susan and about uh, tomorrow's um, focus on the ecumenical accompaniment program. Uh, a question came in, what role, if any, do the employers have in helping their employees get to work? Or what role could they have? Well, that's a very inside question um, that I, I couldn't really get into with my film because it's, it's another matter, it's another thing. So the, the people who are employed, either it's an Arab, Palestinian, who has... Um, um, I'm not sure how you call it in English, but imagine the person who runs, a, 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 you take a, a construction places and construction deals, and then you bring the workers and you pay them. So you, you, you are the one who facilitate the, the situation. Um, there are two. So there is the Palestinian Arab ones who are living with an inside. Either they have the Jerusalemite ID and mainly they have also the the Israeli citizenship, so they can be from the uh, 1948 Palestinians um, who were giving the citizenship. Um, and the, se the second one is the Israeli uh, employees, employers, uh, which uh, they also choose and they make, uh, uh, in a way, contracts. If they have the permit, they make contracts with them. Um, there's another thing about people who get into without permits and that's another story as well uh, but there's no way that they can make anything easier for them to get in or to get a permit so the way that israeli authorities deal with the permits is that they, they, they there's regulations there's rules if i am married and i am above i think nowadays 26 i can apply for a permit of course, after, again, the security check, after the magnetic card, um, and then I can apply for it, and then I can try to uh, find a job. If, for example, a person who has, uh, we call it a security dot, a security check, a security background that is was not, maybe they once arrested him in a protest or in a, even a peaceful protest. If you were, if, if, the, if your picture were, was taken holding a Palestinian flag in one of the Jerusalem protests, for example, then this is for them is a big mess. Um, there is ways that you can put lawyers who will take these security dots uh, away from your profile, but you pay lots of money for that. And usually people, um, either keep going inside without permits, and that's so dangerous and much dangerous because you have no rights at all, whether insurance, whether um, yeah, even like as as a as a worker right. Uh, uh, so 
they cannot actually interfere within these regulations or further regulations that they put. Uh, they can only offer you the job. And that's, I think, sometimes uh, is good enough for the Palestinian worker who is urgently looking for a job. Thank you. One of the compelling uh, persons in the in the film is the narrator, the narrator, the interpreter. Uh, and I wonder if you can just share a little bit more about him uh, and because he is such a compelling uh, interpreter of the reality there on life. Um, he's philosophical and at the same time descriptive. Uh, can you just share some more about him and your interaction with him, both on camera and off? Yes. Um, it's a great question, Peter, about this guy. He's, he's honestly like one of the, the people that like, really sticked with me and, and I, I learned so much from him. He's actually, Peter, the father of Abed, the coffee guy. And um, I, I, I really didn't, I, I don't want to keep saying, like, sometimes I, I say, why didn't I show it in the film? Maybe there's no space for it. Maybe it doesn't matter. But he is the father of, of, uh, of Abed. And so when, when, I, when I got, excuse me, when I um, started going there, I, I had a very good advice uh, from my advisor. And uh, I had great support from Dar al Kalam, by the way. This is just to mention on the side. Um, and the faculty there at that time. Um, I was advised not to, to really point my camera right away. Uh, so I had my camera on my shoulder and started meeting people. It was so hard for me to, to in a way, uh, if I can use the term, catch workers and speak with them and ask them about their, uh, their daily, uh, this daily you know, routine that they're doing. Um, so instead, uh, I started you know, buying falafel sandwich, uh, getting a tea, uh, going around the people who display their 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 stuff to sell for the workers, and these people actually wake up much earlier in a way. Um, so around uh, twelve, like twelve a.m., they they start uh, bringing their stuff, uh, their wooden plates, and everybody knows their spot. Everybody has their spot. Um, so I started talking to them, and from them I started getting like, uh, what do you feel about these workers? How do they, they feel? Because they see them every day. They know what they feel. They are part of them. And also they are workers in a way, but they work on the checkpoint. Um, and so I chose a, uh, Abed because he was willing to talk to me while he's working. And in a way, they love his coffee. It's And he's, he's a very also, Abed is, is uh, He's always, he have these words, I don't know, Peter, in the middle, he was like, God is with the patient uh, people, you know, the, the people who are patient, God is with them. Uh, so he keeps saying these sentences, and in a way, they are also calming, perhaps for the workers, while they're getting their coffee in the middle of this ugly lane. And when going down to Abu Sa'id, he's, um, he's very slow. So sometimes I notice that the workers do not really like to stand and buy from him. The ones who know him, of course, because they want to support him. But he's like an old man. You know, he, he needs like a minute to get the plastic bag in order to put the bread inside. <laughs> so, um, and he started talking to me. And he said in the beginning, I think you will get a brilliant film on the suffering of these people. And that's something that and I, I added it in the beginning. Uh, sometimes people don't don't notice it because it's really in the beginning. But he said it to me. He knew that there's something that there's something in this checkpoint that is massive that people don't see. Uh, and I, Peter, I asked him simple question like, "How do you feel? Uh, what do you think they feel? Um, what do you think of the situation?" Like, very simple questions because I don't know. I felt that. He is part of it, and he really knew what to say about it. Uh, he feels it every day. He's an old man standing on his legs maybe more than eight hours, keep you know selling to provide his own family as well. 
Um, and the way he talked to me on the camera, when I went back and started watching the footage, I couldn't believe it, honestly, I mean, the way he talked about the whole situation. And I'm lucky. I'm lucky, I think, to, to be able to capture this, not for my own benefit. I'm lucky that I was able to be at that moment in order to capture this, again, moment, um, in order to share it with people. Thank you. Uh, you referred to patience uh, in your answer um, and his quote about, uh, about God is with those who are patient. Uh, one thing that came, comes across in the, in the film is despite the, uh, the obstacles and the, uh, the competition uh, that is, is happening, um, people are in, in line calmly and are, uh, for the most part, um, you know, orderly um, in a situation of, of disorder and disruption of their lives. Um, and uh, they are the ones who are cleaning up and preparing the, the corridor beforehand, getting the barbed wire out of the way. Uh, and they are the ones keeping it uh, clean, cleaning up afterwards as well. Uh, can you just share something about, uh, about that aspect of what you observed uh, as you were filming? Um, yes, for sure. And I had, I had a big question on the editing table whether to put these footage of people jumping on top of you know each other in order to uh, to break the line and all that. Um, and then I decided actually I want to put this because it is reality. Um, it is. I don't want to disrupt any reality, and I don't want to hide anything. And it's not a matter of hiding. It's it's. And it's not a matter also for exposing. I'm not like coming here to expose my culture, whether it's organized or not, or people are kind or not. Every culture, every society has its own ways of doing things. And uh, many, and actually the, the, the bigger part of the people who are actually are very respectful. They're very respectful to each other. They're very respectful to elderly people, very respectful to women. Like I said, they make them go through because they're, much less amount and also in a way respect to the culture of, of uh, not being touched or harassed or so these are the aspects that I, I admired on that checkpoint as well and I admire in my own culture um, but then you have these you know um, young let's say <laughs> uh, people who don't really care um, about uh, lanes or, or, or respecting other people's time. But then I had a conversation with one of my advisors, Saad Andoni, once about also adding this or not. And he said, you know what, I don't think that this is their fault, in a way, even the ones who cross on top of the people. Because in a way, you put them in a situation where they're getting this, you know, they're putting their, their, their selves in the beginning, whether it's about other people or it's not, no, it's about them. It's about them getting their own living. Um, so I, I was actually, yeah, I, I started feeling, in, yes, I, I understand that they still need to respect people who come first and they come much earlier in order to avoid all this jumping and imagine someone Tipping on your head at 4 a.m. with their shoes and it's like they're working. It is, yeah, I mean, it's not right. Uh, but then you, 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 you look at them and you start feeling that, oh my God, like we are driven to be like this. The way that this whole checkpoint is designed, the way the work forces, the way they're asked, the way they are even taught is all because of the occupation in a way. And I'm not laying this on the occupation like I, I want to say all of our faults or all of our acts or um, are because of the occupation. But in this particular matter, on the checkpoint, it is the checkpoint matter. If the checkpoint was designed in a better way, let's say, or not, look at the way I'm talking, I'm saying if the checkpoint is designed, I'm not even saying, you know, me, I'm not even saying, if the checkpoint is not there, let's say, let it be not a checkpoint, you can show your card, get in, get your work done, go back. But then this is how Israel sells itself, of course, it's security. And, 
yeah, the whole world believes it. Um, they can sell the story again and again and again and again. Even even shooting a press person with their vest and helmet in the head, and they still can say the these are Palestinian, uh, you know. Um, gunners who are we are they they shot it and this is you know it, it's it's uh people say that they reminded of muhammad al durra which is the 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 murti from uh, the, the second intifada um the first or the second um second, lost, no. second uh, intifada, the yeah. second. Mm -hmm. and they start saying yeah these are not we we did not shoot this kid with the, with his father hiding him you know yani, i don't know so again peter Yes, there is, uh, to end my answer, um, there's utter respect for each other and they try as much as they can because they are in a violent environment already. So they try to keep this calmness, to keep this patient. Um, but at the same time, sometimes you are pushed to, 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 to show your, your worst set, your worst state, which is not respecting others. You are pushed to do that. You are put. You are put in an inhumane situation to do so. Um, but I think the coffee effect. You know, the, the Arabic coffee is so strong that it's come, it makes everybody angry. <laughs> yeah, yeah there, there are so many ways that this film uh, challenges um, perceptions and stereotypes uh, that people might have who aren't familiar. And uh, so I, it's something we want to make sure that uh, as many people see as possible. Uh, there are two questions left and uh, one is very specific. And then the, the last one is, uh, is maybe a little bit more uh, philosophical. Uh, so the first one is uh, regarding um, salaries. Uh, how do salaries compare for work in the West Bank versus work in Jerusalem and other parts of Israel? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. The, just as a comparison, um, the minimum wage in Israel now is 5,450 I think, if I'm not wrong, but it's 5,000, which is around almost uh, $1,600, $1,700, let's say. The minimum wage in Palestine is 1850 which is, uh, I don't know, Peter, $600? $500 or $600, yes. Mm -hmm. $500 or $600. Monthly. You're talking about no. month, yes, monthly. Yes, sorry. Yes, I know that the US you do it annually, but here it's more monthly. Um, so and imagine that prices are almost, almost. We're talking like fragile, like differences in prices between Israel and Palestine. You know, markets are the same. Like the, the prices are the same. So people. So that's why. Palestinian workers and young people who want to get married, they want to, you know, build their houses and, and you know, raise a family. They're, they're, they're really jumping into the Israeli work because they get fed. But again, it's much harder. So you get the money, but it's much harder. Um, so to get back to the question, sorry, Peter, I think I... Um, so yes, you get paid much better in Israel if you work there, but if you get the, the permit. And for example, for the person who asked the question, uh, let's say I'm a filmmaker. Um, I want to work inside Israel. It is very hard. It is like 90% impossible for me to get a job inside. So again, it, because I am a Palestinian from the West Bank, um, Palestinian from Palestine. I don't have the, the Jerusalemite ID, the blue ID, the Israeli ID, or the, the Israeli citizenship. Um, so I cannot actually, either I go work in construction, which most, like 99% of Palestinian workers work in construction, uh, or, or, you, or you work here back in Palestine. And also, on the side of this, there comes the question of, the bio cutting 
working with Israelis. But this is not for the Palestinian workers because this matter is between the Palestinian community, community, it is a divided topic. It's a divided discussion. And people say, it's, you cannot tell people who are following their living to boycott or not to boycott because they're providing to their families. But we are talking about uh, more of uh, sophisticated jobs, let's call it, or whatever. Uh, maybe I'm not using the right uh, terminology, labor. but um, yeah. yeah, yeah, work labor. It's that there's the question of boycotting. Since I, am, I don't hold that Jerusalemite ID. Uh, because the person who holds it can, because they need to work there, because they live within that community. The last question is one of the is probably the first one that was asked, but one I wanted to save as a concluding question. Uh, the question is about the title of, that you chose for this film. Uh, I wonder if you could share something about uh, the poet whose uh, poem, uh, Think of Others, this line was taken from. Mahmoud Darwish is the poet. Can you just share something about who he was and what he means to the Palestinian people? And then say something about how you chose this line uh, as the title of your film. Um, yes. Um, uh, to be honest, I am not... Uh... I don't have much information about Mahmoud Darwish because Mahmoud Darwish is a Palestinian poet. He is uh, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of modern Palestinian poets. Um, he was uh, very close to Abu Ammar, uh, Yasser Arafat, um, uh, and um, yeah, I'm. Uh, there is a. If anybody is thinking to visit, if and you want to know, learn about. The, there's the Mahmoud Darwish Museum in Ramallah, which is a very great museum uh, that I really recommend going there. And there's also for Yasser Arafat in Ramallah. There's some great museums there. It's becoming really good. Um, about the way I let me answer the, the part where how I chose it. Actually, I did. I didn't. Uh, Peter think of, of the name until I showed a cut uh, of the film in the beginning where I was cutting it uh, to my family and my mom was sitting. Um, and after she watched it, uh, she mentioned, she was like, oh my God, it's like a hamam and they're like the pigeons who they get their, their, their living. Um, my mother is very sentimental and she's also uh, a devoted uh, Muslim believer, and she prays, and she, so she had this very, um, uh, I admire it, uh, very, like, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know how to call it, Peter, it's, it's, uh, it's this connection with things that is very, uh, I lost my words in English, it's sentimental, or Sounds it like is, you're, it you're is. describing something spiritual, even. <laughs> yes, yeah, spiritual. Um, so she, she, um, she, she described the workers as pigeons, and she she mentioned it from Mahmoud Darwish, and she knew that it came from Mahmoud Darwish. So, and I know the this poem particularly, and I added it at the end of the film. Uh, because it really comes, and it, it's like it's, the film is made um, like the poem is written in a way. Uh, it's about people. Mm -hmm. I'm not comparing myself to Mahmoud Darwish, of course, but <laughs> in my own, in my own way, <laughs> in my own way. Um, and then I added the poem, uh, and then I named it from Qut al-Hamam. It was very hard for me to translate it to English. Um, but Qut, then the word Qut, means the amount of food that you provide to yourself in order to survive. Mm -hmm. um, and pigeons do not eat a lot. I mean, not the European pigeons because they get a lot of from the tourists. They're always there, <laughs> bread crumbs, so they, they get fatty. <laughs> no one's that. Um, yeah, and the pigeons are the workers in a way. Thank you. Uh, Krista has put in the chat a link to, uh, to that particular poem, and I encourage people to read it. Uh, your video has made us uh, think of others uh, and to be aware uh, of the reality of Palestinians, even as we go about our daily lives, which is really part of the essence of, of that poem. 
Uh, we're grateful to you, Baha, for your work uh, and for your willingness to be with us today, uh, for your generosity of time and spirit. And we want to wish you all the best in your continuing studies and projects. Uh, and we look forward to seeing more of your work uh, as you uh, continue in your career. Uh, we also want to thank our audience today for joining us, uh, hoping that you'll stay with us for the week's focus. And Becca has put in a number of links already in the chat. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have a chance to hear from a Disciples member who spent three months in Bethlehem as part of the ecumenical accompaniment program in Palestine and Israel, uh, an, an ecumenical program launched in 2002 by the Jerusalem Churches and the World Council of Churches. Global Ministries has endorsed the program and supports it. Susan Brogdon will share with us her experiences and learning uh, tomorrow, and she served in Bethlehem uh, and at Checkpoint 300, which is the setting of this film today. Uh, we also have a webinar coming up on uh, Wednesday called Resisting Apartheid, Promoting Justice and Planting Olive Trees. And that link uh, that you can register uh, to participate in is also in the chat. Uh, and uh, Krista has put in some additional resources uh, that are available through our website uh, for you to, uh, to use. Thursday, we look forward to an opportunity for you to engage through advocacy. Uh, look for the third Thursday alert as it is published. And Friday, we will have more opportunities to, uh, to encounter Palestinians uh, in meaningful ways. So we're grateful to uh, Bahat once again and to our audience uh, and look forward to your continuing engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming and watching this.